Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. My name is Amy Ahern. I'm one of the deacons here. Welcome. Welcome to worship at the First Congregational Church of Woodstock, an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. We are a congregation that welcomes you wherever you are in your life and faith journey. We validate the humanity and human rights of all individuals within our communities, thus creating a more accepting, affirming, and inclusive society in which everyone can live authentically and without fear. We recognize these rights, affirm faith journeys, and the spiritual and humanity values of dignity, respect, and equality for all. We are pleased to share today and see our friends from East Woodstock Congregational Church as we share our summer union services together. As a reminder, worship will be hosted at 9 a.m. here for the Sundays in July and then move to East Woodstock in August as well as Sunday, September 1st. Thank you to all who are helping to make this worship meaningful, musicians, readers, coffee hour hosts, tech crew, and you, and all your energy. Like last week, we welcome Reverend Pam Bollinger as our preacher. And as a, again, as a reminder, after service, all are welcome through the doors uh, on my right here to Harrison Hall for sharing in coffee hour. And I would add, for all of creation and all creatures, as we deal with the droughts, the intense heat domes, the massive flooding that is destroying homes and lives and livelihoods, and all places of violence where people use hatred and, to, and violence to try to oppress and hurt and silence others, and prayers also for first responders, all those who put themselves in harm's way, never knowing when they get the call what they're gonna find. And so prayers for them as well. Let us be together in a spirit of prayer. Holy and amazing God, you are the source of all life, love, and forgiveness. You are our creator, our redeemer, and sustainer, and we give you thanks and praise. We thank you for all the ways that you have blessed us this week. We especially thank you for blessings that we take for granted and don't even notice that are gifts from you. For family, for friends, for opportunities for rest and recreation, to learn and study, or for work. We ask your blessings on all who are celebrating anniversaries or birthdays or family gatherings. We thank you for those in our lives who have been blessings but now have joined the great cloud of witnesses. And we ask that you bring comfort, peace, and hope to all who mourn this day. And all who are suffering in body, mind, or spirit bring healing comfort, peace, and strength. For all the caregivers, grant them strength, peace, and hope. For all our leaders, may help them to use their power wisely and do what is best for all of creation and that is pleasing to you. And for all who work for justice and peace, whether they be in the military or in the first responders, all who are trying to help others guard, guide, and protect each and every one. And be with us that we will be vessels of grace and healing, sharing your light with, and love with others in our words, in our deeds, and in our silences and in our presence. We lift up all our prayers, spoken and unspoken, in the name of Jesus, who taught all his followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Will you please join your hearts and voices in the prayer of invocation. Holy God, you are as close to us as our very breath. As we sing your praises, share the prayers of our hearts, and listen to your word. Help us to be aware of and to experience the power and presence in our midst. May our time together glorify and please you and equip us for faithful living and loving this week. In Christ's name we pray. Glossy, black above, white beneath, glinting in white banded necklaces, chin straps, and dappled robes, common loons glided on the lakes from May to October, piercing souls with their cries and their calls. The striking plumage, the calls, all in spring and summer, is in service of offspring. In early spring, icon, spring loons put on their black and white ritual dress to woo mates and to warn off rivals. The males rise up in the water, beating their heavy wings, yodeling, signaling. This is my mate, my lake, my what nest, my chick, ready to press that insistence to the death. If an adversary approaches any of these, he seems to laugh, manic with alarm. If a mate or a chick drifts too far, the partner or parent will wail. Here, come here. 10 million years before any human heard them, loons shivered the lakes with their calls. But by early September, they prepare for another life. Surviving chicks have grown to independence. Adults, freed from the need to mate and ever defend one's own, shed their bold identity. They let the spectacular feathers fall away to be replaced by the plain gray. Through the fall, they gather and swim in peaceful flocks former rivals and all, feeding communally. They give up their peace piercing calls for gentle hoots to bond with and assure each other. I'm here, we're here. Together they were gathering strength. When ice began to crackle the lake edges, the adults set out on an arduous journey Built heavy and solid bone for deep diving, loons have to flap their stout wings continuously 250 times every minute to stay aloft. No missing even a single beat, not for seven or 800 miles. Their young were not with them, Juveniles lingered on their birth lakes and set out later, small groups of them alone, left to an inner guide to pilot them to a place they've never been. In September of 2008, I had felt led to go on a wilderness renewal retreat in the Boundary Waters Canoe Winter wilderness of Minnesota. One week of silence with two others as we reflected on God in our lives and in nature. And I love loons and I was really excited because I was going to be in loon country. And I thought for sure I'd be seeing them every day. And I tell God I really want to see loons, that I know you're with me. And each day we, I saw, or we saw, maybe one maybe another one. Occasionally, I might hear a call. So by the end of the week, I was like, God, I haven't heard or seen the loons that I thought. Now I understand why I wasn't hearing them so much. 
And as we had that long paddle out to the final lake and to our car, I noticed that a loon started swimming up behind us. And the closer to home we got, other loons started following us. And I went, wow, I've got a, we've got a trinity of trinity of loons behind us, nine loons. And we came into the lake, and our car was, was on the other side of the lake. And all of a sudden, there's these loons who are flying in, and I watched them make their landing on the water. Have you ever watched that? Bump, bada, bump, bada, bump. They're rough landings. And I felt bad for them. And occasionally, one of them would want to take off, and it would go across the water, boom, bada, boom, bada, long and laborious, boom, bada, boom, bada, and then gradually go up. And I watched this, and I took it in, and I'm like, I wonder what the message is here. So as we stood, my colleagues and I on the beach, and we did a final prayer service, the loons were right off the shore from us, in a big raft of them, being very quiet. We said our goodbyes and our prayers. And then the, my colleagues, one of the colleagues said, let's sing the doxology. So we joined hands and we did an a cappella, joyful singing of the doxology. And as we started singing, the loon started singing with us. And we all looked at each other with awe and wonder. And we knew they were singing to God's glory. And when we stopped singing, they became quiet. I was dropped off at the airport, and I had one of those puddle jumper planes, you know, real small ones that would go to the bigger airport, and it was raining, and I don't like to fly. And as I sat in my seat and doing my deep breathing to say relax, images of the loons taking off across the water gave me comfort and peace as I felt the plane bumping down that cement runway and taking what I felt was a difficult takeoff. And when we came landing, bumpity bumpity bump, there was the loon in my mind's eye landing on the lake and God whispering, I am always with you. See, I am always with you. Our reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 9. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you, all the families of earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abraham took his wife, Sarai, and his brother's son, Lot, and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran, and they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abraham passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abraham journeyed on by stages towards the Negev. <clears throat> Will you be with me in a spirit of prayer? <clears throat> God, be present now in my speaking and in our listening. God, be present now in our understanding. 
Come, Holy Spirit. Comfort, convict, convert, heal and transform and save. For to you, O God, belongs all honor, glory, and praise. Amen. <clears throat> when I was growing up, one of my favorite shows was the Mitch Miller Show. Did any of you watch it? With the songs and the bouncing ball. And to this young girl's heart, the song Bicycle Built Daisy Daisy Give Me Your Answer True just touched my deep romantic heart. And I love to sing it. And I love to be that girl looking sweet on the bicycle seat for two. So when my husband Gary here and I got married, we would go for bike rides. And no matter how hard I tried, no matter how good a shape I was in, no matter how good a bicycle I had, I could never keep up with him, even when he was going slow. He would pedal ahead a quarter of a mile or more, disappear from my sight, discover I wasn't there, stop and wait. And as I'm pedaling as hard as I can to catch up with him, he sees me and just as I get up there ready to rest, he's all rested, he hasn't exerted any effort yet, and he takes off. And this is how it would go. So I kept saying, we really need a tandem bicycle. And I would watch people when we go places, and I'd see them. Have you ever watched two people on a tandem bike are poetry in motion? The way they pedal their bikes together in harmony, and when they take the turns, they both lean together. It's so graceful. I just love that intimacy and the poetry and the harmony in the moment. So we started looking for a bike and hoping to find one. And one day after a hike, we happened to stop just for the fun of it in a bike shop. And there it was, a beautiful Schwinn red bicycle with blue speckles, my two favorite colors, in our size. And it was about 30% off. It clearly had Pam and Gary's name on it. So we go up and we look at this bike. And while the salesman was talking to my engineering husband all about the technicalities of the components, I'm humming Daisy Daisy to myself. And the salesman looks up to me and he said, by any chance are you two married to each other? And I said, well, yes, we are. And he goes, oh, you do know these bikes don't work for married couples. <laughs> and I naively said, why not? I mean, that's not going to affect us. He goes, ma'am, do you realize this back seat, the stoker seat, has no steering control and no brakes on it? All those decisions are made by the person in the front, which is my husband, because it was built for his size and I had the back. Perfect fit. Um, no problem. I love my husband. I trust him. This is going to be wonderful. We'll finally be together on a bike ride. This is going to be great. And it was wonderful. And then we left the parking lot. And there was the gravel and the stones. And we're going downhill. And I'm trying to lean the bike away. And I'm trying to brake. And I'm yelling. And, and he's like, oh, this is wonderful. I'm like, it's too fast. It's too fast. We're going to fall. And I'm doing everything I can to try to lean and turn and avoid and put on brakes that don't exist. The quick lesson is, I learned, we have to communicate clearly at all times. Now, I liked being in the stoker seat because when I get tired, I could just say, I'm too tired, and he would keep pedaling. But we would have to coordinate. But I also noticed when we pedal, I'm staring at his back. That's in the center of my vision, is my husband's back. And I need to keep talking to him and him to me. You don't just stop, you don't just turn. I learned very quickly that we have very different comfort zones on a bicycle. And we also have different ways of going places. We would mutually agree we're going to the library. So in my mind, I know it's the exact route we're taking. And so did my husband. And they were two different routes. 
And that meant I was trying to turn and lean when he was not, and vice versa. A lot of communication, a lot of focus, and a lot of me on the stoker seat, getting rest, making it easier, and being with my husband, but also having those comfort stones challenged. And that is how I view our life, our sacred earthly journey through this world, earthly world, that we, with our relationship with God, are putting ourselves either on the front seat or the back seat of the tandem. Either God is in control and we are there allowing God to take us where God wants to go, or we're fighting it tooth and nail, or we're getting on the front seat and we're telling God, okay, you pedal hard, and this is where we're going. The theology of being on the front seat of the tandem is the bad theology of God is my co-pilot. Our theology in our Protestant tradition, Christian tradition, is that God is the pilot, and we follow, and God provides. In this story this morning that we heard from Genesis, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. God didn't say, I want you to go to this place. It's going to take this long. And I'll give you this trip tick that we'll know where to stop, what to do, and how, to stay, how long to stay. This was a time for Abram and Sari to depend on God each and every day and listen to what God was calling them to do. And Abram listened. It took so much trust and courage, and there must have been a longing, deep longing in there to be close to God because he packed everything up, everything, including relatives, and he was 75 years old, and off they journeyed. Abram followed God, but every once in a while, if you continue on in Genesis, you will discover that Abram didn't always trust God's timing. God may not have told him enough, or he was too restless, and so he would go ahead when he felt it was the right thing to do, and he would have his wife be disguised as his sister in order for something to happen, and do things that weren't being faithful. But then he would get back on track. Abram journeyed on by stages toward the Negev. He didn't know what the stages would be until he was in it. He didn't know where to stay until God said stay, and he didn't know when to go until God said go. And that is so much a re like our faith walk, our spiritual journey with God. But one thing I know from my experience and the other people's experiences I've read about, those who seek and long to be in a faithful, loving, trusting relationship with God, who spend their time in prayer, that when they do get on the stoker seat, they will go places they never dreamed of. They will do things they never imagined. They will have blessings that burst their heart and overwhelm them with joy. And they are a blessing to others. That applies not only to just us individuals, but also to faith communities. When the church is in a position of transition, a senior pastor leaves and the search is on, and you're in that anxiety-provoking grief time of transition, when there are those who want to go back to the old ways and those who want something new and those who just want the old minister back in their comfort zones, that's the time to intentionally sit on the stoker seat collectively in prayer, listening for God's guidance, 
Because this I know, in the economy of God's grace, when God blesses me or a group of individuals, we are being a blessing to others. And that it, no everyone is a winner and a receiver in the blessing of God's grace. And when you're a church trying to decide what's new, what's different, what do we keep, what do we let go of, God, and we listen to God, we'll learn what to do. And God, when God says let go of something, something that is good and wonderful that we really love and makes us, gives our identity or comfort, it's not that that thing is not good or wasn't good. It means we need to make room for more blessings and more growth on our transformation in our journey to be more faithful disciples and to be more loving and kind. I was I've been talking to a friend of mine from high school. We reconnected at our reunion recently. And she majored in early childhood education and development. She was a professor and head of her department in New Hampshire. And then she retired to Arizona. I told her I don't get it, even though she explains the reason I love New Hampshire, but this was a good move for her and her husband. And she's a very talented woman, very creative, very wise, smart, loves children, and has all these different skill sets. And she's also a very deep, faithful Christian and a person of prayer. And she told me that when she retired to Arizona, she had no plans what to do with her life. Now that she didn't have that 60, 70 hour work week, she was open to whatever God was going to bring to her. And so she talked with God on the stoker seat and said, okay, I'm ready for whatever you have. I just have two requests, that it be creative and it be of service to you and bring love and hope and light to the world and make it a better place. One of the things she loves to do is quilt. And she happened to go to an exhibit with her group, quilt group of children who were refugees and immigrants crossing the border. And she heard some of their stories. And she was struck by their pain and the fear and all these negative feelings that they were exposed to and experienced. And she had an idea. Let's make a welcome quilt for the children. And so she shared it with God and others. And before she knew it, they were making welcome quilts. And then they needed a bag to put it in. And being a teacher, she said, well, we need a pocket to put a book in. And then she created questions for the parents to use, to talk about with the book, with the children and the quilt. And one Christmas, I received a patch of material in her Christmas letter saying, please make something with this quilt, design a welcome message, and send it back to me. And we will turn this into a wel part of a welcome quilt for children. Every step she took being faithful opened other doors. And she never quite knew which way she was going. And she'd be excited and she'd pray about it. And she'd think, ah, this is the door we're going to go through next. But instead of rushing through it, she prayed. And that door would close and a window or would open. And sometimes a wall that she thought was a wall had a door in it. And she keeps telling me, I never imagined the people I would be meeting, the places I would go, and how many people are helping. This small group of four quilters who heard the story and decided to make welcome quilts, the welcome quilts are now being made around the country she has designed a curriculum to go with them. They're being displayed in museums in Arizona. She now had, then she had to design a retreat for leaders to lead. And she and a friend have written a book that is being published about this. And the whole purpose is to spread love and peace and to let children know they are loved and to bring healing. When she said goodbye to her home and her job in New Hampshire, she had no idea what was, she would do with her retirement. 
but she chose to get on that stoker seat each and every day, talking to God, listening to God, allowing God to take her places that used both her gifts and challenged her comfort zones so she grew. And people, adults and children everywhere, have been deeply blessed. So I wonder, as you go about your daily lives, which seat do you choose? Every decision we make, we're sitting either on the back stoker seat or on the front. Will you choose the stoker seat? Asking for God's help to choose it and see where God is going to take you and receive the blessings that you never imagined. The world needs us to choose the stoker seat so that we can spread God's light and love and healing and grace in ways that we can't even begin to imagine until we say yes to God and let God be that Christ, be the center of our vision and guide us on our journey through life. Thanks be to God, for God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Jennifer Duggan and I'm a member of First Church's Governing Board. Uh, we are so grateful that our two congregations share our gifts and talents through our summer worship in many other ways throughout the year. Today, more than ever, our world, our nation, our neighbors here in the quiet corner need communities of hope such as ours. The many gifts you share, your talents, your presence, your leadership, your creativity, your financial support, provide the resources we need to bring Christ's light, God's love, and the spirit of hope alive in meaningful ways every day of the year. If you would like to support our ministries through financial gifts today, you can place your envelopes in the offering, plate, uh, offering plates at either entrance and please designate on the outside of your envelope if your gift is for East or for First. You can also give online uh, or find where to mail your gifts on the respective websites, either eastwoodstockchurch.org or firstchurchwoodstock.org. Please rise as you are able as we sing our doxology. <coughs>
join me as together we read our prayer of dedication. Holy and and generous God, God, in grateful response to your generosity, grace, and sustaining love, we return to you a portion of what we first received from you. Receive these gifts. Bless them, the givers and the receivers. May these gifts be used to further the work and ministry of Jesus Christ in the world, bringing healing, hope, peace, and justice. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Join me in the closing words with your hearts and voices as we set our intentions for our living this week with the grace of God's help. Let us go forth in peace, being of good courage, holding fast to that which is good, rendering to no one evil for evil, strengthening the faint-hearted, supporting the weak, helping the afflicted, honoring all people, loving and serving the Lord, and rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now as you go forth into the world that God created and loves and for which Christ died, go in the confidence as you journey forth on your sacred earthly journey that you are never alone that God is above you, watching over you as the good shepherd who loves you. God is beneath you, holding you in God's arms when you're at your weakest moments. God is in front of you, calling you forward in faith when you're not sure of the way ahead. God is behind you, encouraging you forward when you want to turn back. God is beside you, holding your hand through whatever you may face this day or night. God is within you, as close as your very breath, giving you the grace and strength to carry on. Go now in the love of God, in the peace of Christ, and in communion with the Holy Spirit. Beloved children of God, amen.